So um, I think most of everyone attending today has attended session one, but if you haven't, I just wanted to give an acknowledgement to our planning committee. committee. Um, so our Fuels Friday came together um, as a collaboration between practitioners and researchers. Um, and our committee is consists of Jen Beverly, she's assistant professor with University of Alberta, Laura Chasmer, assistant professor with University of Lethbridge, Dave Schroeder, a prescribed fire program coordinator, Alberta Wildfire, Dan Thompson, forest fire research scientist, Canada Forest Service, Brian Wines, managing director of Canada Wildfire, and myself, um, I'm the knowledge translation and localization specialist with Canada Wildfire. So I will pass it over to Brian now, who's going to talk a little bit about the Wildland Fire Canada Conference. I think actually what I'm going to suggest we do is we wait a couple more minutes till everybody has had a chance to join before we go any further. So please stand by. We've still got people joining on a fairly steady basis. So we'll continue on in about seven or eight minutes here. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So should we pause then for a little bit? Okay. So stand by everyone. Hi everyone. Okay, we're going to restart this now. Um, uh, welcome again to Fuels Friday. Um, we are on Fuels Friday session two, February 12th. And um, today's session is fuel measurement, where it started and where it's going. So before we begin, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. So the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and First People, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vi vibrant community. So welcome, everyone. Um, so before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge our planning committee. So Fuels Friday came together um, over the last four, four months or so through a collaborative effort between practitioners and researchers. And our committee is Jen Beverly of the University of Alberta, Laura Chasmer, University of Lethbridge, Dave Schroeder with Alberta Wildfire, Dan Thompson, Canada, Canadian Forest Service, Brian Wines with Canada Wildfire and myself, also with Canada Wildfire. So welcome everyone to today's um, session. And um, just before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording this session. So we will have this as a resource um, in, it'll be in our e-class uh, site. And I think most of you have had uh, the instructions to log into e-class. If there's any problems, you can email me and I'll help you out. So I'll just pass it over to Brian now, and he's going to talk a little bit about the Wildland Fire Canada Conference. 
Welcome, everybody. We're particularly pleased to see a good response again, and I think it will be well and worth your investment of time. And I just did want to highlight for you that uh, the Wildland Fire Conference is still on the books. We're still planning to go ahead. Um, it is not entirely decided whether it will be a virtual conference, a hybrid conference, or an in-person, but we're really hopeful that by October 25th to 29th of this year here in Edmonton, we will be able to hold at least part of the sessions in person. And we certainly will be making provision for those who are unable, who are uh, um, at this point sort of concerned with travel so that you'd be able to both attend and present remotely. Uh, the actual call for papers is just being drafted right now. Um, we're working on a draft website. Committees have sort of been formed and being put into place. And so we should be able to move forward with that very quickly. So um, we're encouraging people to start putting that on their calendars and start thinking about it for the fall. Um, and just as a little bit of a side note, just for people who might be aware of the answer, Strategic Wildland Fire Research Network, which is uh, coming up to its one year anniversary, We'll also be holding some meetings um, just because of the year. There probably won't be a lot of results yet, but we'll be able to give people an update on where that's at as well. Turning it back to the rest of the gang. Thanks. Enjoy the morning. All right, so I'm going to pass it over to Jen Beverly now. She will be hosting the rest of this meeting. So enjoy. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Beverly and uh, I'm going to be your guide through this morning's uh, program. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, you can all see the E-Class uh, course website. And uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, an orientation to, uh, to the workshop site here. If you scroll down, you're going to see today's session and we've got a, an amazing lineup of presentations for you. Uh, and I want to just give you a bit of a roadmap to uh, how we're going to proceed but also do take note of the content posted here for you. So we've got the speaker bios and I'm not gonna be going through formal introductions. Uh, most of the speakers have given a little blurb about themselves um, on the, uh, uh, when they introduce themselves in the presentations, uh, but you can also find some extra information on the, uh, the workshop site. So there are some podcasts here under the session two podcast page. I will be posting videos of all the presentations today Later, uh, the PDF links to the presentations are already here. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that we've set up a forum. We're gonna have very limited time for questions today because we've got so many presentations to share with you, uh, but there are two online forums set up here so that you can post questions directly to presenters here online and we can follow up and continue the discussion over the next week and a couple of weeks moving into sessions three and four, okay? So as we proceed through part one, you're gonna have some very in-depth uh, information about standard and traditional fuel measurement methods in a very kind of tutorial style. So there's a lot of information there and a lot of detail and we've got four presenters. I'm gonna pause between each presentation and you'll have a chance um, to post questions to the chat. We'll try to field a couple of questions uh, per presenter as we go through. Now, part two is a little bit different. These are really short, eight minute, overview presentations, micro talks, and uh, we're gonna run through those one after another. It's, it's gonna be a bit of a whirlwind tour. And then at the end, we'll take some questions uh, for all of the presenters and, and I'll choose some out of the, the Zoom chat. And as I said, uh, if we don't have time to get to your question, post it to the forum here and our speakers will, will follow up. Okay, so with that, let's kick it off. We're gonna start with, uh, with Bill DeGroote and he's gonna be talking about surface fuel load. Now I'm just gonna test here. Were you able to hear some of that video? Okay, so I'm just gonna stop my share and restart it here. Make sure that we have sound working. All right, so this should work. My name is Bill DeGroot. I'm an adjunct professor with the University of Toronto and retired uh, forest fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, today I'm going to talk about sampling surface fuels and I'll start out talking about the applications of uh, fuels data and the types of fuel sampling that we do and then I'll get into the details of how you sample different fuel uh, layers and I will end the talk talking about 
uh, how fuels are used to calculate fire behavior. And fuels are information is calculated for a number of reasons, but it, it usually comes down to uh, fire behavior. So fuels data can be collected to assess the fire risk or potential uh, around, uh, for instance, a, a community or uh, generally at the landscape level. Uh, fuels data can be used to develop a prescribed burn prediction. Um, it can also be used to predict fire effects, such as carbon emissions, depth of burn, or correlating uh, mortality regeneration to fire behavior characteristics. And fuels data can be used to uh, develop new fire behavior models as well. So the first question we ask ourselves is, well, what do we sample? And the simple answer is we sample what burns. So you wouldn't sample things that you know really aren't going to burn or contribute fuels to a fire. So for example, if you know that the depth of burn is only gonna be a few centimeters and you have a deep organic site, uh, you wouldn't be sampling for bulk density uh, 40 centimeters down. So you reduce the amount of, uh, of fuels that you, you need to sample. Uh, if you're unsure whether or not something is going to burn, you would sample it uh, just in case. So the different layers that you would sample are uh, the organic forest floor fuel layer, which includes uh, litter, fermentation, and humus layers, as well as lichens and moss, uh, herbaceous plants, dead and down woody debris, shrubs and vegetation or uh, regeneration and that would be trees that are less than uh, diameter breast height so the first type of sampling that we do is for fuel moisture and we sample this using metal containers uh, we typically sample uh, moisture content for fine fuels and that's because fire spreads through fine fuels and fine fuels change their moisture content very quickly they're constantly exchanging moisture with the environment um, and we would normally sample fuels like litter, needles, lichens, and moss <clears throat> immediately before we would do a burn. And then we would uh, seal these containers with uh, a metal lid and tape around the edges so that the moisture uh, stays within the container. And then we would oven dry these, uh, open the containers up, oven dry them uh, until the samples reach a constant weight, which usually takes one to two days at 70 degrees Celsius. Um, it's good practice to dry samples at 70 degrees Celsius because if you dry at a higher temperature, like 100 degrees, uh, for live material like needles, you would be driving off volatiles, which is part of the weight that you're wanting to measure in those fuels. The other type of fuel sampling we do is for fuel load. <clears throat> for herbaceous plants, we would do this using clip plots uh, for regeneration. Uh, you could use basal diameter measurements if there are biomass algorithms available for uh, those tree species. Usually there isn't. Usually uh, tree biomass algorithms begin at dBH uh, height. Uh, if you want to sample for biomass of regeneration, you can do destructive sampling, clipping. Uh, in an experimental burn, we would typically do destructive sampling outside of the plot so that we minimize the, the impact of the, uh, the burn plot itself, <clears throat> any disturbance to the plot. So you would do uh, clipping and develop a, a correlation between the basal stem diameter and the amount of biomass to that, um, that, that uh, seedling. And so you could develop new algorithms for, uh, for the area that you're, you're, you're burning in. Uh, shrubs, uh, not often sampled, uh, usually because they are either a species that really doesn't contribute fuel to a fire, like, for instance, willow, which it, it may be part of the burn, but um, at most it might just scorch the leaves and there really isn't a fuel contribution to the fire, or because shrubs are so sparse that they really don't, they really don't have much fuel to contribute to the fire. Uh, however, if you do uh, have a case where there is a substantial amount of fuels and you want to know what the biomass is, you probably have to develop your own uh, algorithms that uh, could be done, again, correlating basal stem diameter with the, the biomass of uh, the parts that you clip. Uh, but you also need to develop fuel consumption models. And that's something we don't have in Canada is uh, good fuel consumption models for, for, for shrubs. But you can develop your own models as well. Again, doing the clipping and then correlating that with a basal stem diameter with biomass or with canopy volume measurements with biomass. So you would measure each uh, individual shrub uh, as a cylinder. So there's a diameter to the size of the crown and a height and you would uh, get biomass from that. 
So the other two layers left to sample are forest floor and dead woody debris. And Alberta has a field sample, sampling manual that describes how to do this. Uh, different provinces use different uh, approaches, but the same techniques. So a line intersect method is always used for um, determining dead woody debris fuel loads. And normally fuel forest floor sampling is done along the transect as well. So in Alberta, there are four transects of 25 meters that are laid out in a cross pattern uh, to collect this information. And with dead woody debris sampling, it's really about partitioning all the fuels into different diameter uh, classes. So di size classes one to five would be for pieces of dead woody debris that are under seven centimeters in diameter. And then there's two classes for pieces that are greater than seven centimeters in diameter. And that is by sound and rotten uh, uh, categories. So for the fine and medium wood, woody debris pieces, which is less than seven centimeters, you would lay out this transect and any piece that falls under the line that is less than seven centimeters, you would just determine what size class is it in. And you would use a, a GONO gauge to, uh, uh, to estimate that. <clears throat> and so it's simply counting the number of size pieces uh, in each of those classes. For coarse woody debris, which is greater than seven centimeters, you would measure every piece with calipers, and then you would classify each piece as rotten or sound. And the Alberta manual has a good description of how to classify uh, decomposition. So once you've collected the data, you can then calculate the fuel load using this equation. And the weight of, of, the, fu the, of, of the fuel is, is, is determined by the specific gravity of the species that you're measuring, the tilt angle of the piece, uh, the number of intersections, uh, the diameter of those pieces, and the slope of the of the transect line and the length of the line. Uh, fortunately for here in Alberta, there is a, a few studies that have been done that greatly reduce the complexity of those calculations. Uh, work done by uh, Ian Nalder and others uh, came up with uh, a set of simplified factors that could be used in the boreal forest region <clears throat> for size classes one to five. Uh, Delisle and Woodard have uh, another equation that uh, has some factors that can be used in the montane region. And Bessie and Johnson also has some specific gravity values for uh, species in the subalpine region. So for in Alberta, I would recommend uh, going from this original equation to this simplified equation by Nalder. Uh, for size classes one to five, where they use a, an M factor. Uh, for pieces that are greater than seven centimeter or size classes uh, six, uh, sound and rotten, I would use this equation uh, you can find in Delisle and Woodard, where uh, it, it uses the summation of the diameter squared of the large pieces, the specific gravity, and the slope um, of, the, of the line and the length of the line. So that's how you calculate fuel load. Uh, usually what you wanna know though is what the fuel consumption is. And so how do you measure fuel consumption? Well, it's simply a matter of, of resampling those exact same uh, transect lines after the fire and comparing that to the, the amount of fuel that you have before the fire uh, to what's left uh, afterwards. For the coarse woody debris pieces um, on the original line transect before the burn, you would install a nail uh, at the point where the transect line crosses the wood. And that's because um, during the fire, a log will, will move a little bit. And by having a nail in there, you'll be able to measure the exact same spot that you measured it before the fire. So forest floor fuel sampling. Um, along these 25 meter transects, there are five points where forest floor depth is measured and two points where samples are taken. If you were doing an experimental burn, uh, you would do these samplings uh, of the forest floor outside of the plot, again, to minimize the disturbance that you would create to the plot uh, that you're, you're planning to burn. So along those 25 meter transects, there's uh, two points where you do forest floor sampling. <clears throat> and what we would do is uh, extract a monolith uh, of organic soil. So you would cut down uh, usually about 15 centimeters square down to mineral soil, and then you would carve it off in layers. 
separating by litter, moss, the F layer, and the H layer. And if any of those layers are greater than two centimeters, you would separate it uh, by two centimeter layers uh, in between. Then you oven dry all of those layers and you have a nice description of the bulk density by depth uh, for the forest floor layer. And that information is used to determine uh, fuel consumption. So before the burn, <clears throat> we would install these depth of burn pins where there's a horizontal bar that is placed at the top of the surface uh, organic forest floor fuel layer. After the burn goes through, we go in and resample. We measure down from those horizontal bars to determine what the depth of burn is. And then we can correlate the depth of burn with the bulk density samples for those depths. Uh, this picture here shows uh, uh, pins that were set uh, on matted grass because we were measuring the depth of matted grass that was burned. So that's how you get fuels and uh, fuel consumption. Uh, how, do you, how do you use this with fire behavior? Um, well, two things that are usually wanted to be known about a fire is, number one, is it gonna be a surface fire or a crown fire? And secondly, what is the overall head fire intensity of that fire? So the surface fuels data are used to calculate the critical surface fire intensity, which will dis determine whether it's a surface fire or a crown fire. And to do that, you need uh, an estimate of what the surface fuel consumption is, what the live crown base height is of, of the trees, and the foliar moisture content of the needles on those trees. Uh, if the fire does become a crown fire, <clears throat> we use the surface fuel consumption plus the crown fuel consumption to calculate the overall head fire intensity. Uh, I won't go into the details of how we calculate this, uh, but there are uh, prediction tools and models available to help you do this. Uh, one of them would be the Canadian Fire Effects model, which has a, a web version, a PC version, and an Excel version. And as a, as a quick summary, uh, I think most people are probably familiar with the structure of the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. Uh, you know, there's the FBP system, but it has 16 distinct fuel types, but you can't adjust any of the fuels information in the FBP system as it stands now. There is a next generation system, uh, FBP system that's being worked on, uh, but it won't be available for about five years or so. In the meantime, uh, you can use CANFIRE, which is a model, uh, um, an integrated science management model that resides outside of the FBP or the danger rating system. And it's driven by uh, information from the FWI system, as well as uh, rate of spread algorithms from the FBP system. And the third driver is fuels information or forest inventory uh, that's input into CANFIRE. So in effect, what CANFIRE is doing is allowing you to use fuels information with the FBP system. And the output is that it provides information on fire behavior, you know, rate of spread, fuel consumption, fire intensity, and type of fire, as well as physical and ecological fire effects. So that gives you an overview of uh, why we sample fuels, uh, how we sample fuels, and how we use it to calculate uh, fire behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so uh, we have a minute or two uh, for, for questions for Bill. Uh, we can take those in the Zoom chat. And as I said, if you have uh, questions that are more involved, we can post those to that E-Class workshop site for follow-up uh, from Bill and other presenters throughout the day. Um, later on. But if we do have any, any quick questions for Bill, we can take those. Otherwise, I'm going to move us on to the next presentation. Okay, Bill, so there's, there's a question there. Uh, is CANFIRE set up for all Canadian fuels? Uh, no, it's not. It's set up right now just for boreal uh, forest fuels, but it is something that you can um, uh, go in and, and adapt it to fit any, any fuel situation you want, any species or whatever, yeah. Okay. Okay, so so maybe we'll we'll move on to the next presentation. As you're thinking of questions, you can post those to the chat, and we will try to follow up if there's time uh, this morning. Otherwise, again, I will transfer any questions that it, we didn't get to to the Zoom chat. Uh, well, we'll just take one more here. Uh, Bill, do you uh, do you do much ground truthing of DMC values prior to burn uh, to add extra context uh, to duff consumption? Uh, yeah, on experimental burns we do, and that's typically where you would get into the uh, the moss, the sampling of the moss, and uh, and the F layer. Yeah. 
It wasn't just okay. fine fuels. You also do some of those, uh, the, the, the less dense uh, duff fuels as well. Great. Well, thank you, Bill. Let's uh, let's move on to our, our next talk. Uh, we're going to hear about uh, bulk density. Hello, and welcome to a Fuels Friday video about fuel weight and bulk density. My name is Dave Schroeder, and my colleague Steve Vinegard and I will be your narrators. This video is organized into three sections. We will start by covering some definitions and then go into a bit of depth with a case study. The case study will demonstrate why fuel weight and bulk density are both important for fire behavior understanding and forecasting. We'll wrap up with some general considerations for planning data collection to obtain these parameters. You will also see fuel weight and bulk density covered in other Fuel Friday presentations and videos an indicator that these are important parameters. Bulk density and fuel weight are common parameters used to describe fuel structure and are used in fire growth prediction models either directly or indirectly. For example, the Rothermel surface fire model includes a bulk density parameter, whereas the present version of the CFFDRS fire behavior prediction system uses fixed fuel weights and bulk density associated with specific forest fuel types. Other models such as CANFIRE and CFIS model, which we'll use in our presentation demos, allows users to input fuel weight or bulk density values. Fuel for this presentation refers to organic material, living or dead, that can ignite and burn. Fuel load is often used interchangeably with fuel weight. Bulk density refers to the weight of the fuel per unit volume. This simplified demonstration shows how flammable material with the same weight will burn differently when bulk density is changed. On the left, the 8x10 sheet of paper has been tightly folded and the bulk density is highest relative to the other pieces of paper. The piece in the center has been tightly crumpled and the right piece has been lightly crumpled. You can see the variation in fire behavior the, and the folded piece will not even sustain an open flame. The video demonstrates two important fuel parameter considerations for fire behavior. First, bulk density can affect the rate at which fuel consu is consumed and second, bulk density will affect the proportion of total fuel weight that is burned and as such influence the amount of available fuel for com combustion. As the video demonstrated, fuel with the same weight but different bulk density values will burn differently. The question then is why bother with fuel weight? First, fuel consumption by weight is the basis for Byram's fireline intensity calculation, so we need the weight of fuel being consumed. Another reason is that collecting fuel weight is much more straightforward than bulk density. For example, reliable and efficient methods have been developed to sample dead and down woody fuel weight. Similarly, tree biomass weights can be calculated using one easy to collect measurement, diameter at breast height. Adding fuel depth in order to get bulk density is straightforward for some fuels, but can also add complexity and effort to collect the data as we will demonstrate. As well, an accompanying video focuses on challenges specifically associated with measuring one important parameter used to obtain fuel depth, canopy base height. The values at the bottom of the slide show canopy fuel load and bulk density for two adjacent sample plots. due to differences in tree height. Wildfire management is increasingly focused on mitigating risk around communities, infrastructure, and other values. One way that agencies address this challenge is to use a variety of vegetation management techniques intended to reduce wildfire hazard. The importance of vegetation management around the wildland urban interface is a driver for much of the current fuel structure research. As you can see in the list on the slide, changing fuel structure 
can be an important strategy within the overall goals of a wildfire mitigation plan. Vegetation management plans can benefit from having targetable measures, such as reducing fuel weight or bulk density to quantifiable values. We'll now move on to part two of this video. In some jurisdictions, the, task, the tactic of masticating or mulching vegetation has been used to displace fuels from the canopy to the surface. Mulching is not as effective as fuel removal to mitigate fuel hazard, but is more cost effective to implement. Test burns in mulched black spruce stands indicate that fires in mulch fuels are less intense and slower moving relative to natural stands, and as such are more likely to be suppressed. In part two, Steve will demonstrate how fuel weight and bulk density affect fire behavior in mulch fuels and will present some of the challenges to collecting this data. In the introduction, four vegetation management principles were presented. Generally, in mulch fuel treatments, displacement is the primary principle applied by converting canopy fuels and surface fuels to a more compacted layer of woody debris. Several different techniques are used with various machine types to create unique fuel beds, each having different characteristics such as fuel particle shape and size and fuel bed depth. The fuel bed in this right of way is unique in the uniformity of debris size and distribution. However, this homogeneous fuel bed may be more of an exception as most masticated fuel beds include other fuels such as grasses and shrubs. Every fuel bed has different characteristics that influence fire behavior. In mulch fuel beds, compaction of chipped debris and other fuel particles influences airflow through the fuel bed and the rate that fuels dry. Compaction can also impact fire spread and fire intensity. Can bulk density be used as a measure of compaction and used to calculate potential fire behavior in a mulch fuel bed? Destructive sampling is often conducted to determine the fuel load and bulk density of mulch fuel beds. This process and calculation of values is very straightforward in a uniform fuel bed such as this one. In a study of potential fire behavior in debris fields in hydro rights of way, we evaluated the debris using destructive sampling to determine bulk density and then determine the volume of fuel assumed to be available for combustion. Bulk density was determined through destructive sampling in several mulch pits. From previous experimental fires and moisture sampling, we observed that fuels deeper than five centimeters were too moist for consumption. Using this as an assumption, it follows that available fuel equals 6.3 kilograms per meter squared. But this seems like a large loading of fine fuel available for consumption. What kind of fire could be expected in this fuel bed? Most fire behavior prediction tools don't model these fuel beds well, but attempts at modeling fire behavior have been made using Behave Plus. This projection in Behave Plus using 90th percentile conditions indicates fire behavior with low intensity and low rate of spread. Experimental fires in mulched fuel beds have given us good insights into potential fire behavior in these fuel environments. Unit 2 at the Pelican Mountain Fire Smart Research Area was designed to study fire behavior in mulch fuel beds that have been treated using varying treatment intensities. Three different mulch treatment prescriptions with varied intensity were applied in the three subunits. This resulted in three distinct mulch fuel beds with different fuel characteristics. Coarse mulch was produced using a low intensity mulch treatment with one pass to knock over stems and remove branches. Key characteristics of this fuel bed include a greater volume of roundwood debris, a lesser amount of mulch debris, and a relatively undisturbed surface fuel layer. A normal mulch intensity is the standard typically applied in industrial operations such as clearing for industrial sites or right-of-way maintenance. The regular mulch fuel layer has most aerial and surface fuels processed into chip debris. Some disturbance of the duff layer occurs but is generally not prescribed in mulching operations. A high intensity mulch treatment thoroughly mulched all vegetation and mixed this with the duff layer. This resulted in a fine mulch fuel layer 
with a higher percentage of smaller debris and a greater extent of mixing with duff and some mineral soil. In characterizing these fuel bits, bulk density was considered as a metric to compare compaction of the fuel bits. We applied the data collection methods described earlier to determine fuel load and fuel bed depth. And these measurements resulted in some confounding results in that bulk density of all these fuel beds was similar at 150 kilograms per cubic meter. This didn't seem like an intuitive result since we expected that there would be a greater difference in bulk density to reflect the apparent differences in compaction. A possible explanation for this was that with only five depth measurements per quadrat, this did not accurately capture the scattered coarse mulch or roundwood. Therefore, alternative sampling methods need to be considered. Moving past the characterization of these unique fuels, our next objective was to observe and compare fire behavior in these distinct fuel beds. In these simultaneous burn trials, in the three fuel beds, there were some notable differences in fire behavior. Flame length, rate of spread, and depth of burn were measured and analyzed. We observed the most vigorous fire behavior in the coarse mulch fuels. We attribute the greater fire intensity and more rapid rate of spread to an undisturbed surface layer with greater continuity which promoted more efficient fire spread. In contrast, fire behavior in the fine mulch fuel bed was relatively subdued with low flame height and slow rate of spread. The compacted mulch fuel bed with lack of vertical continuity inhibited fire growth and generation of fire intensity. Fire behavior in the regular mulch fuel bed was close to that of the fine mulch fuel bed. The intact moss layer and other undisturbed surface fuels contributed to slightly greater rate of spread and fire intensity. These observations of fire behavior in these burn trials in the different mulch fuel beds provides decision support for practitioners applying mulch treatments in boreal forest stands where high intensity mulching is an option. The results calculated for bulk density prompted some pause for thought in how we measure fuel bed depth in these variable fuel loads. As Steve indicated, our initial mulch sample data did not reflect the observed differences in bulk density. We concluded that the initial sampling technique that only captured the average bulk density was too coarse. Because of time constraints, we could only do some informal remeasurements where we collected samples in 10 centimeter vertical increments. This process resulted in a lot more time needed to collect the samples, but results suggested we could now differentiate between the treatments based on bulk density. Here's another example using grass fuel types. The Alberta Wildland Fuel Inventory Program has conducted some exploratory data collection for grass fuels in Alberta. The intent was to better understand differences between matted and standing fuel types and how to determine the degree of curing. In the FBP system, degree of curing is an input for the grass fuel models and assessing that value is largely a, su a subjective call at present. The matted grass in the photo on the right was sampled in the early spring prior to greenup. That matted grass is still there in the summer, along with new growth as shown in the photo on the left. From a fire behavior perspective, the grass in the left photo is likely to be classified as greened up and will in reality support little, if any, fire. Strictly by weight, however, the total sample would indicate a high degree of curing because the dead matted grass has much greater weight in proportion to the new green grass. Stratifying the samples vertically helped to differentiate cured and green grass, but added a lot of effort to collect the data. To wrap up, we will show some examples of challenges around using new data in an existing fire growth model, and we'll present some considerations of scale when collecting data or applying models. The final slides are about change. Good fuels data, including weight and bulk density, are relatively scarce. In order and to improve that, new methods of collecting data are needed, along with potentially new or modified fire behavior models. Practitioners are challenged with using models or data that are not sufficient for their needs, whether that is for fire operation support or planning a mitigation project. 
On the other hand, researchers are interested in working on solutions for practitioners that re may require adapting to new processes. In reality, introducing change to well-established models like the FBP system is not straightforward, nor is the implementation or uptake of new models. Here are two examples where applying fuel weight or bulk density to models needs to be done with careful consideration. The Crown Fire Initiation and Spread or CFIS suite of models was built on a wide range of wildfire data sets and allow users to input their own fuel structure data. The models did not include wildfires with mulch fuels explicitly, so use of mulch fuel weight as an input could result in misinterpretation of potential fire behavior. In the second example, again using the CFIS suite of models, we show a graph where a detailed vertical profile of the canopy bulk density for a stand does exist, but the model only accepts one input. In the case of CFIS, there is quite a bit of documentation supporting the model development, inputs used, and sensitivity to input parameters, so users can make an informed decision from the literature. We will conclude the video with a brief discussion about scale. Going back to this diagram shown at the beginning of the video, a few things come to mind. First, the images represent a small forest stand at a spatial scale that resonates with human observers. One can easily see the variability within the stand both horizontally and vertically. And it is straightforward to imagine that through time some of the overstory trees will die and fall over and many of the understory trees will become dominant, resulting in changes to fuel weight, bulk density and other fuel structure parameters. Fuel weight and bulk density quantities change through time and that occurs for many reasons. Accounting for sampling timelines is an important consideration when applying fuel structure data to a model or other analysis. For example, forest inventory data sets may be used by agencies where available to categorize forest canopy data into FBP fuel types. Forest inventory data, however, is collected at variable time intervals and at a provincial scale when it's aggregated will feature data representing variable snapshots and times, sometimes spanning 20 years. Moving to spatial scale considerations, at a plot level, the photos in this slide show a black spruce stand sampled by the Alberta Wildland Fuel Inventory Program. The plot radius is 11 meters, and you can see that there are some openings and dense canopy within the plot. Normally, plot level fuel weight and bulk density calculations will be aggregated to a larger stand, but will the aggregated data be representative of that stand? The reality is that natural forest structure is highly variable as the photos show. A companion video demonstrating the use of LIDAR data to map fuel structure shows that this variability can be captured at a very high resolution. Zooming out, this photo shows an aggregation of fuel type patches and the fire seems to be burning more intensely in the dark green patches. The light green patches are likely fens and the dark green patches will be black spruce stands. From the previous slide, we saw that black spruce stands can be quite heterogeneous in terms of fuel weight and bulk density. Is that variability influencing the fire behavior at this scale or is coarser data more appropriate? Zooming out even further, this hazy scene contains a larger mosaic of upland deciduous forests black spruce stands and fens in the mosaic, and a fire in the background. How are fuel weight and bulk density important at this scale? Or do other fuel structure parameters have more importance? Fuel weight and bulk density data are important information for fire behavior research and operational forecasting. The data are expensive to collect, and as such, we don't have enough relative to our needs. As accompanying workshop videos will show, new technology has much promise to meet this need, but also the potential to be misapplied. Thank you for watching this video and we hope you enjoy the rest of the Fuels Friday workshop.
Thank you, Dave and Steve. Uh, and I'm going to open it up now for we have time for a, a couple of questions before we move on to the, the next uh, presentation. If anyone's got uh, got questions, you can post that to the chat. And, and I've got to say, I love the visuals in, in your presentation. I really like that crumpled paper video. It's awesome. <laughs> All right, so if you have questions, we'll just give you a moment. You can type them into the chat. And again, if we don't get to your question or you think of something later, please do post uh, any, any questions that, that aren't addressed today, this morning, uh, to the online forum on the eClass workshop site. All right, everybody's still digesting that. So why don't we move, we'll move on to the next presentation and we'll circle back at the end. Uh, if there's questions for any of the presenters, we should have a couple of minutes uh, to take those as well. So you can post those to the chat uh, while the, the, uh, the uh, following presentations are screened and we'll, we'll come back to them if we can live or we'll put them on the, uh, the forum on eClass and the speakers can respond to them there. So let's move on uh, to a presentation. Hello, everyone. In this Fuel Friday video, we will talk about how Canopy Base Height is used by wildfire behavior modelers or practitioners and discuss some of the difficulties associated with measuring Canopy Base Height in the field. Canopy Base Height is an important metric used in numerous wildfire behavior models. When referring to wildfire, Canopy base height is considered as the lowest height above the ground at which there is sufficient canopy fuel for a wildfire to propagate vertically through the canopy. This threshold height is often used in wildfire behavior models such as the Canadian Fire Behavior Prediction System, Farsight, and Nexus to determine when a surface fire will transition into a crown fire. Crown fires are much more difficult to extinguish compared to surface fires and fire managers often use these models to determine if and when a crown fire can be expected around values at risk. If the risk is too high, mitigation measures can be taken, such as conducting prescribed burns or implementing forest treatments, which will decrease the chance of a surface fire to transition into a crown fire. We can see from these research test burns the importance that canopy base height has on wildfire behavior. On the left is a spruce tree with low-lying branches. Even with low surface fire intensity, the low canopy base height is able to support flame propagation into the canopy. The pine trees pictured in the middle and right images are not experiencing flame propagation into the canopy, even with substantial surface fire. This is because these stands have been pruned and have a much higher canopy base height. Please note that the white bands on the pine trees are not natural, as this was part of an experiment that involved girdling the trees. Nonetheless, it shows how canopy base height can affect potential wildfire behavior. We can see from these images how a critical surface fire intensity has to be reached before a surface fire can transition into a crown fire. The photos from left to right show a fire developing from a line ignition to a point where the critical surface fire intensity is high enough to engage the crowns in an intermittent crown fire. Duration from left to right is eight minutes, and the distance is approximately 30 meters. These are jack pine trees with a crown base height of three to five meters. Based on the theory of crown fire initiation by Van Wagner, a surface fire will only transition into the crown once a critical surface fire intensity, which is based on canopy base height, is reached. Despite canopy base height being a critical metric for numerous fire behavior models, it can be difficult to measure in the field. Theoretically, canopy base height is defined as the height above the ground where there is sufficient canopy fuel to propagate fire vertically throughout the canopy. However, what do we consider as sufficient canopy fuel load? Guesses and assumptions have been made in the literature as to what canopy fuel load thresholds should be used, but have yet to be proven practically or theoretically. Most often, canopy base height is defined by the work conducted by Van Wagner in his Conditions for the Start and Spread of Crown Fires paper. Here, canopy base height is calculated using the average live crown base height measurements for a stand. Canopy base height represents a stand level characteristic, where live crown base height represents an individual tree measurement. 
live crown base height is considered to be the lowest height above the ground where live fuels have the ability to move fire further up the tree. Unfortunately, measuring the live crown base height isn't always clear cut and can sometimes be subjective. In many sampling manuals, it says to measure the height between the ground and the lowest live foliage of the obvious live crown, but often this isn't obvious at all. For example, sometimes there are large gaps in live crown foliage on the trees or asymmetrical morphology where the live foliage is not evenly distributed throughout or along the tree. In these cases, is it still best to take the lowest height above the ground to represent the stand? Although there are different ways to consider where the live crown base height begins for fire research, most suggest measuring from the ground to the height at which most live branches and twigs are continuous, while ignoring sporadic branches. Unfortunately, this still leads to some subjectivity. In the cases presented earlier, we suggest that the live crown base height should be considered the lowest point above the ground where fuels start to become vertically continuous. If measuring on a hill, height measurements should be made from the uphill side. All that being said, there is some doubt as to whether live crown base height is really the best metric to describe when a surface fire will transition into a crown fire. For example, if we are considering only live fuels, then what about the buildup of ladder fuels on the tree itself? In some stands, live foliage can begin quite high off the ground, but the buildup of dead branches and lichen would make it easy for a surface fire to climb into the crown of these trees. Smaller vegetation, such as seedlings and shrubs, can also act as ladder fuels that help transition a surface fire into a crown fire. Is live crown base height really an appropriate metric to determine when a surface fire can transition into a crown fire? A better way of describing crown base height may also consider ladder fuels that are in close proximity to the tree being measured. Therefore, any crown base heights would not be biased by characteristics of the trees around it. Trees growing in a dense black spruce stand often have natural pruning of the branches that are touching or shaded out by other trees. When the clump of trees is considered as a whole, the crown base height may be touching the ground but if measured separately, we may come to a different conclusion. Whether live crown base height is the best metric or not for determining when a surface fire will transition into a crown fire is often used for calculating canopy base height. Van Wagner, who developed the theory of crown fire initiation and whose work has been incorporated into numerous fire behavior models, considered canopy base height to be the average live crown base height for the stand. This has been incorporated into Canada's Fire Behavior Prediction System, the main model used in operations to predict wildfire behavior. It uses the average live crown base height expected for a given fuel type. The development of the Fire Behavior Prediction System is based on empirical evidence, so does inadvertently account for whether or not the stand has ladder fuels. Others have used canopy bulk density profiles to determine where the canopy base height should start. By plotting available canopy fuel in one foot vertical layers, a vertical distribution can be evaluated. The fuel calc and fire and fuels extension to the forest vegetation simulator programs use this method. Canopy base height is determined to be the height above the ground where canopy bulk density reaches the critical value of 0.011 kilograms per cubic meter. However, this value was chosen rather arbitrarily and lacks both empirical and theoretical evidence to show that it's an appropriate threshold to use. Using this method to calculate canopy base height in conifer forests of Western North America has led to an underprediction of potential crown fire behavior. Recently, remote sensing methods have become increasingly more common for measuring canopy fuel parameters. Of the different types of remote sensing, LIDAR may have the most potential particularly in dense forests, as it has the ability to penetrate the canopy and provide detailed structural information about the fuel layers throughout the entire canopy. However, even the utilization of LIDAR has been accompanied by limited success in predicting canopy base height. For example, models have been created by Hillary Cameron at the University of Alberta to predict canopy base height using LIDAR data in black spruce stands. The figure on the right shows a correlation between testing data and the model outputs. 
The x-axis represents the field measurements for canopy base height, and the y-axis represents the canopy base height values predicted by the model utilizing LIDAR. In order to satisfy the basic requirements of linear regression, a square root transformation was performed on the data. If the model was perfect and could precisely predict canopy base height as measured in the field, all the dots would be directly on the one-to-one -one diagonal line. The large amounts of scatter you see around the diagonal line represent the error of the model, meaning it is not performing as well as expected. The poor performance makes sense when we think about how complex some forests are. Looking at this black spruce stand, it is hard to determine an appropriate canopy base height in person. How are we supposed to develop models to measure things that are difficult to define even on the ground? Remote sensing has been used with moderate success for other stand types, but when vegetation is relatively continuous between the forest floor and the tops of the canopy, it is very difficult to develop highly accurate models for this forestry parameter. Which brings us back to one of the main questions. What should be considered the canopy base height of a stand? In some ecosystems, the traditional assessments on a tree-by-tree -tree basis may work, but for dense black spruce stands and potentially many other fuel types, we see that it may be more pertinent to use a holistic approach that considers other stand attributes such as ladder fuels and natural clumping. In this video, we don't provide solid answers as to what should be considered the canopy base height of a stand because there aren't solid answers out there. We do outline how different fire behavior models calculate canopy base height and how to perform these measurements in the field to properly utilize these models. We also highlight some of the main issues with using canopy base height measurements to predict wildfire behavior. We would like to thank you for listening to our presentation. We would also like to thank the Canadian Partnership for Wildland Fire Science and Alberta Wildfire for organizing these fuel talks. Thank you, Hillary and Brandon, and as well, Dave, participating in this uh, presentation as well. So I'm, I want to open it up for a question or two on, uh, on this presentation. The, Sonia has posted a, probably a pretty in-depth question that I'm sure we can continue talking about uh, on the online forum, as well as in sessions three and four. Um, but just to, maybe to, to focus in on, on uh, what she's posted here. So she's asking, what how do we scale these measurements and what do they mean for fire behavior so what do all these measurements mean across broad landscapes and i think that that, that would be open to to dave and and steve as well as uh as this uh second presentation on crown base height yeah so i think that um measuring crown base height it changes between different scales. So on a much bigger scale, maybe you don't care about the very fine measurements. And maybe that's why um, the FBP system works because you're looking at broad landscape scales. But the more our fire behavior models develop, um, the more we may need those very fine measurements, such as with the fire tech model, these very, very fine um, details on fuel structure uh, so I think maybe your definitions um, can change depending on the scale, but I don't really have an answer as to uh, what that should be. I think the canopy base height arguments change a lot um, depending on what scales you're looking at and forest structure types. Um, yeah, so if anyone else has anything to contribute to that, that's kind of my two cents. Hi, it's Dave here. Yeah. I Great comment by, uh, by the, in the chat room and uh, Sonia, uh, I obviously didn't provide any answers, mostly questions in my, in my slides. And I think um, one of the questions I often ask is, is what is the accuracy and precision needed for a fire behavior model? So when we're dealing with fires around the urban interface, it's quite critical to be very accurate and precise. Uh, and on other landscapes, less precision is needed. So having some of those ideas, I think will help possibly define targets for what, what a model performance should be.
Okay, so th there's a number of comments and questions here. We won't have time to to get to all of them. Um, so there was a question here about, uh, would you recommend defining lichen covered branches as the same as live branches in terms of crown base height? I would. Oh, sorry, Dave, you go ahead. You have to model, you have to match the model with the data that it was developed for. So yes and no. Certainly the work that uh, Ginny Marshall is doing and, and, and along with Dan Thompson using uh, fire, uh, fire tech, um, that those fuels are accounted in, the, uh, but in, in the case of fire tech, there's no canopy base height. It's just a continuum of uh, fuels or it, that are blocked out in two meter increments. So yes and no is the answer to that one. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So we're going to keep it moving uh, in considering uh, time limits here this morning. So uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Again, there's some great comments and, and new uh, posts to the chat that we'll, we'll make sure we follow up either on the online forum or if there's time at the end. So this is uh, next, we're going to continue moving upwards into the, the canopy into the crowns. And we're going to close off this part one session where we've been really taking a deep dive into the traditional fuel measurement methods and looking in, in a, sort of in an, an instructional way about how that's done. So we'll move on to our final presentation for this part one. And uh, after that, we'll have some time for a couple of questions. Good day. I'm Marty Alexander. I retired from the Government of Canada in November of 2010 after working for nearly 35 years as a fire behavior research officer with the Canadian Forest Service. In semi-retirement, I've worked part-time as a consultant, researcher, and volunteer. This presentation in session two of the Friday's Fuels Workshop Series deals with the subject of computing canopy fuel load and canopy bulk density from field measurements. There are three objectives to this presentation. Number one is to point out how canopy fuel characteristics influence various aspects of crown fire behavior and conifer force. Secondly, to explain the general processes involved in determining canopy fuel load and canopy bulk density in outdoor experimental burning studies. Thirdly, and finally, is to briefly describe the field methods involved in sampling the tree and stand structure variables used in quantifying canopy fuel characteristics. First off, it's, it's a good idea to get familiar with some of the basic terminology and general principles involved in characterizing canopy fuels. Let's take a moment to acquaint ourselves with the terms and concepts as shown in this illustration. Consider the canopy base height and the stand height, and in turn, the live crown depth. Note that the canopy fuel load is largely represented by the needle foliage. Now the canopy bulk density represents the canopy fuel load divided by the live crown depth. Finally, as noted at the bottom, appreciate that the ladder or bridge fuels constitutes the various fuel components in the stratum between the surface fuels and the aerial or canopy fuels. We will now examine each of the canopy fuel characteristics in greater detail. The canopy base height is one of the fuel inputs used in determining whether or not a surface fire will transition to a crown fire. The other inputs being foliar moisture content and the assumption that the ladder or bridge fuels exist in sufficient quantity to intensify a surface fire. 
The canopy fuel load represents the quantity of oven dry fuel per unit area that would be consumed in the overstory of a conifer forest during a crown fire. The canopy fuel load is typically expressed in kilograms per square meter. Crown fuel loads in closed forests of the boreal typically range from three quarters of a kilogram per square meter to about one and a quarter kilograms per square meter. The canopy fuel load is one of the elements used in determining a crown fire's final intensity as per Byram's I equals HWR fireline intensity equation, where the W in the equation represents the amount of available fuel consumed in the entire strata of a fuel complex. The canopy bulk density represents the quantity of a oven dry fuel within a unit volume that would be consumed in the overstory of a conifer forest during a crown fire. Canopy bulk density is typically expressed in kilograms per cubic meter. A maximum canopy bulk density is typically around about 0 0.6 kilograms per cubic meter. And canopy bulk densities in the boreal forest generally range from 0 0.05 to 0 0.25 kilograms per cubic meter. According to Van Wagner's theory of crown fire propagation, the canopy bulk density largely determines the type of crown fire that is possible, if at all. The lower the canopy bulk density, the higher the rate of spread needed for fully developed crowning to occur. Van Wagner's simple model represented by the curve in this graph has been shown on the basis of experimental crown fires documented by the Canadian Forest Service between 1962 and the year 2000 to do an excellent job at distinguishing passive from active crowning. Note that the critical threshold in canopy bulk density is in the range of 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 kilograms per cubic meter. The CFIS model system for determining crown fire rate of spread is also based on the canopy bulk density in addition to the 10 meter open wind speed and the estimated fine fuel moisture content, which is largely determined by the temperature and relative humidity of the air. To determine the canopy fuel load of a stand requires the following. The tree stem density by diameter at breast height size class distribution based on the number of based on the count trees in a stand or timber cruise. Also a tree biomass or allometric equation based on destructive sampling relating crown foliage weight to the DBH of a tree. As shown here, the general equation for computing canopy fuel load is the summation of the crown foliage weight times the number of stems per hectare for each DBH size class divided by 10,000. The, the total foliage weight is divided by 10,000 in order to convert kilograms per hectare to kilograms per square meter. Note that Van Wagner assumed in his work on crown fire modeling that only needle foliage was consumed in a crown fire. The three main types of stand or timber cruise techniques are shown here. Each involves measuring count trees. You'll find that there are pros and cons to each 
especially when it comes to their use in, a, in an experimental burning study. In this regard, I have found the PCQ or point-centered quarter method to be superior to conventional forest inventory methods. Here's a typical scene of a destructive crown fuel weight sampling. This particular case is from the International Crown Fire Modeling Experiment or ICFMI study north of Fort Province in the Northwest Territories. Generally two to three trees per diameter at breast height size class are sampled. The sampling process is quite simple. For a given tree, the basic steps are measure its DBH, then fell the tree, then measure its total length and live crown length, delimb the tree, separate the fuels into their various components, for example, needles, twigs, and branches by condition and diameter size class. Then obtain the fresh weights of the various components in the field. And finally, return this, uh, the samples to the lab for oven drying. The equation for the ICFMI site for Jack Pine is shown here, showing that the crown foliage weight of a tree is a function of the diameter at breast height. Note the coefficient of variation or R squared value is quite high at 0 0.88. This equation was based on sampling 33 trees with a DBH between 1.7 and 19.8 centimeters. Several similar studies have been undertaken in Canada. Arlen Johnson, for example, a University of Alberta master's student, undertook a crown fuel weight study of lodgepole pine and white spruce in Alberta back in the late 1980s. The results were published in the December 1990 issue of the Forestry Chronicle. Just a cautionary note, the use of generalized equations for estimating crown fuel weights does not take into account the fact that there are regional differences in tree species. Generalized equations appear to work well for total above ground biomass, but needles and roundwood material tend to be much more site specific. Experimental burning studies should, wherever possible, undertake their own separate crown fuel weight sampling study. However, time and expense may dictate otherwise. A three to four person crew can typically carry out the field component of a crown fuel weight study in a week or two weeks, depending on the tree sizes involved. Then roughly another week, for the lab work. To determine the canopy bulk density of a stand requires the following. Canopy fuel load as previously discussed. Canopy base height based on, based on a standard timber cruise of, and a certain number of count trees the mean canopy base height would be, as shown here, the summation of the live crown base height measurements divided by the number of measurements. Similarly, the stand height is determined in the same manner. There are a variety of ways and instruments to measure the live crown base height and tree height of the count trees in a, in a stand or timber cruise. A common technique involves the use of a clinometer and a measuring tape. The print percent scale given on the clinometer after sighting on the point or level of interest, for example, the top of the tree or the live crown base, along with the distance to the tree, are used to compute the live crown base height and tree height as shown in the following equation.
Here's a summary of the steps involved in computing the canopy bulk density, including an actual example. Take a moment to review the steps. The live crown depth is, as previously mentioned, the stand height minus the canopy base height. The canopy bulk density is, in turn, the canopy fuel load divided by the live crown depth. The example is from ICFME plot four, a more or less pure jack pine fuel complex. The number of count trees was 124. The stand height was 11.1. .1. The canopy base height, seven meters, and the canopy fuel load, 0 0.459 kilograms per square meter. The live crown depth is 11.1 .1 minus seven meters for a result of 4.1 meters. Then the canopy bulk density based on the canopy fuel load and the live crown depth was 0 0.11 kilograms per cubic meter. It's worth noting here that the canopy bulk density equation conforms to Van Wagner's methodology. If there appears to be significant quantities of woody fuel consumed in the canopy fuel layer, it may be necessary to undertake a post-burn crown weight sampling study. Early efforts to quantify the degree of woody fuel consumption in the canopy layer following crown fires in conifer forest involved guesstimates or assumptions often combined with ocular estimates. Perhaps the most ex more exacting way is to undertake a post-burn crown fuel weight sampling to determine the woody fuel consumption in the crown fuel layer. Just a brief side story here. Chris Steffner, a U of A forester graduate who appears in these two photos, worked seasonally and part-time for me as a technician from 1995 to 2002. I often wonder if this post-burn crown weight sampling was the reason he took a permanent job in agroforestry with Agriculture Canada. As you can see, it's quite a dirty job. Another word of caution, other methods of determining Canopy base height, canopy fuel load, and canopy bulk density have been proposed by the U.S. Forest Service. But these are not compatible with Van Wagner's theory of crown fire initiation and propagation. This is a good general reference when it comes to computing canopy fuel load and canopy bulk density for experimental burning studies. One can download a copy from the Canadian Forest Service publications website. I have noticed several additional readings here. One can download these publications on the, from the Canadian Forest Service publications website and from the Crown Fire Synthesis website of the Frames homepage. I'd like to acknowledge my good friend and colleague, Miguel Cruz. He and I have worked on various aspects of canopy fuels and, and crown fire modeling for nearly 25 years now. This has been a brief summary on the computations involved in determining canopy fuel load and canopy bulk density from field measurements. I hope it has brought greater clarity to your understanding of these two parameters. Thank you, Marty. And uh, so that's that's wrapping up our part one of, of this morning's session. Uh, and I'll open it up for a couple of questions. We have time for a couple of questions for Marty live.
Okay, so there's a, a question here. What about the use of uh, different hemispherical photography uh, for measuring Crumble density? Is it feasible? And, and this actually is uh, kind of leading into part two where we will be talking a bit about this. Uh, but Marty, did you wanna comment on that? Well, I don't wanna steal your thunder, Jen, but uh, indeed uh, Bob Keane and others at the Missoula Fire Lab have, uh, have attempted that, but uh, I don't believe uh, complete success has been achieved, but it's certainly worth greater uh, exploration in my view. Great. So again, if, if you've got questions for Marty or any of the presenters, uh, feel free to post those to the chat or the online forum on eClass. Uh, and we're gonna continue on to, to part two. Now today is really content heavy. Um, and and the, we designed it this way to give you a lot of content to contemplate in preparation for weeks three and four, where we're going to have some in-depth discussion. So everything that you've seen today is open for discussion when we reconvene in Fuels Friday sessions three and four, which will be more interactive uh, and have a lot more time for discussion. Nonetheless, please do post any questions that, that you have to the chat. Now for part two, we're going to go on a whirlwind tour. We've got uh, five presentations. These are short micro talks, uh, giving an overview of some innovative approaches using different technologies uh, in, in terms of trying to conduct these fuels measurements in different ways. So I'm, I've lined these up back to back and we're gonna watch them uh, in one stream. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions. My name is Jen Beverly, and I lead the Wildfire Analytics Research Team at the University of Alberta. Today I'm going to talk about three projects where we're using photos to characterize fuels. Team members who have contributed to this work include Hilary Cameron, Andrew Stack, Ashwat Sharma, and Jared Randall. Now we've been looking at different kinds of photos, hemispherical, downward facing, as well as photos taken during operational overflights. Before I get into the projects, I'd like to acknowledge our research collaborators, Gaston Diaz, Martin Barzik, and Pranoy Panda, as well as key contributors from Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, Dave Schroeder, and the Alberta Wildland Fuels Inventory Program, CRUZ. And finally, our funding has been provided by Alberta Agriculture and Forestry through the Canadian Partnership for Wildland Fire Science. Now, field sampling is costly, it's time consuming and resource intensive. It's not surprising that people have asked, you know, is there an easier way to get rapid estimates in the field? If there were, it would enable documentation of fuel structure and fuel loads in a much broader range of settings and situations. Now, rapid fuel load estimation with photographs is well established. People have been doing it for a really long time. And there's programs like the photo load sampling technique developed by Bob Keen and others in the US that are widely used. Uh, to estimate fuel loads based on matching photos. There's also been a lot of photo guide development in different situations using hemispherical photography and other photographic methods as well as the photo load method uh, in Canada and in Canadian fuel types. Now one of the questions we had is what kind of new technologies uh, might enable expanded use of photo-based assessment of fuels? In particular, we were interested in whether or not some protocols could be developed for documenting fuels in more operational settings, uh, where there wouldn't be the same capacity to document and, and conduct photo-based assessments in the, in the rigorous way that they might be done in, in a research or an exper experimental burning situation, for example. Now, there was a recent paper um, by Bianchi that had looked at comparing smartphones for hemispherical photography to more traditional professional photography photographic methods and found that actually smartphones performed quite well. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's encouraging. Let's give it a try. Now, we didn't use the same equipment that Bianchi used. We used uh, an iPhone 7 and we, um, we used an Olo Clip fisheye lens attachment to do the hemispherical photos. Following the same basic method that Bianchi had used, uh, you take two perpendicular photos at a location and you can patch them together to, to make a complete hemispherical photo for assessing that gap fraction, the amount of sky that's coming through. Now uh, the data collection was done by Alberta Wildland Fuels inventory crews uh, with some logistical support and training from Andrew Stack. And we, we really did use a, a relaxed protocol which meant uh, 
we ignored almost all the rules around taking hemispherical photos and you know just asked uh, the photographer to to hold the camera um, level at eye level and, and to snap the photo rotate it uh, so it was perpendicular in, in the second photo and and that was it now hillary cameron's been analyzing the data in collaboration with gaston diaz who's who's an expert in uh, this kind of hemispherical photography and in particular in analyzing these photos when they're taken under uh, imperfect conditions like our photos. And the results are pretty encouraging. So this is just showing the statistical relationship between canopy openness documented with our imperfect hemispherical photos taken with smartphones in relation to canopy fuel load uh, that was measured by the OFIP crews at the, at the same plot. Uh, so yeah, pretty good, pretty good relationship for uh, f from just eight photos. Now the other thing we had the crews do since they were there taking the hemispherical photos is to take that fisheye lens off and then just point the camera down and snap some downward facing photos. And you can see there's just a, a wide variety of different surface fuel conditions. And we then had a technician manually classify the surface cover type in the photos and Hillary Cameron has been analyzing the relationship between the the technicians analysis of that sort of fuel type cover um, versus the field data. And it's, it's turning out not too badly considering that these photographs, again, taken with very relaxed protocols um, and in comparison though with the, the ground cover percentages estimated from the OFIP crews using the more intensive field sampling techniques, uh, the relationships aren't bad for some of the cover types. For others, they don't they don't look so great, but I'm, I'm just going to show you the good ones. Um, and of course, it's it's pretty time consuming for a technician to go and and basically paint the photo characterizing the cover types in the photo to do this kind of analysis. And so the natural question was, uh, could it be automated? And so Martin Barsic and uh, Pranoy Panda have helped us out. Um, and Pranoy has been using the manually painted photos, uh, the manually classified photos, to train a computer to automate the process using a supervised learning based deep convolutional neural network. And, and they're performing what's called image segmentation. And so these photos just show you an example the original photo, the manually classified photo in the middle that was done by our technician, and then the machine classified version of that uh, after. Um, Pranoy had uh, developed his algorithm. And now the last project I wanted to talk about where we're using photos is, uh, is the, the overflight photos from operational um, initial attack. So these photos are taken when fires are reported that, you know, crews go out uh, and it's the fire is assessed, photograph is taken, and there's a lot of detailed information about what's going on at that time, which is uh, makes it a sort of a really interesting situation for analysis. And when you look at these photos, and many of them provide really good indication of the fuel conditions, and not just the fuel type, but the structure of the canopy fuels in particular. Uh, so this is work that's being conducted by Andrew Stack as part of his MSc uh, thesis research, and he has limited his analysis to fires burning and black spruce fuels at the time of that initial assessment. And so we're matching the assessment with the photographs with the outcome of the fire. Now Andrew's done a lot of modeling and he's about to wrap up his thesis so there will soon be a you know a full length presentation by him of what he's done but just a you know a little sneak preview uh, he this is one of the models he, he wanted to show um, so this is showing the probability of a fire in black spruce escaping initial attack as a function of smoke color relative humidity and forest structure at the time of assessment and for structure he's just looking at uh, two classes closed versus open uh, which he, he estimated based on the photographs. And then he also extracted other uh, variables from the photos like the color of the smoke, which is a good in indicator of intensity. And so you can see that, that when you've got that you know, high, higher intensity fire um, and the relative humidity is, is dropping, there is quite a difference in the probability of escape depending on, on stand structure. So it's kind of a neat insight using just operational photos. Okay, so what are, as a sum summary, what are the questions we're asking about field characterization? Well, one of the questions we wonder about is what level of detail and precision is, is necessary. If you can get 80% there with 5% of the effort, is, is that good enough? And, and maybe that makes it a useful uh, method. Are we fully explo exploiting simple, accessible, understandable, fast, and expensive, what I'm calling SOFI, 
methods. Um, and then of course, what insights about fuels and fire behavior can be gained by readily available data and documentation captured during suppression operations. So thank you for listening. Uh, that's our website, wildfireanalytics.org, and you can follow us on Twitter at Fire Analytics. Hi, my name is Jeff Bouvier. I'm an associate professor in engineering, and I'm also a firefighter with Parkland County Fire Services. That's kind of how I got into some of this work. So today I'm going to be talking about extracting some fuel characteristics, some fuel data from UAV imagery or drone imagery, as well as uh, taking a quick look at some satellite imagery. And we'll talk about some applications of this. So first, a look at the data that we have available. So there's six locations where we collected uh, UAV imagery with uh, DJI Mavic Mini last summer. The resolution of this imagery is about two to three centimeters, and it's in various locations throughout Alberta. The actual imagery is larger than the kind of uh, plots being shown here. Here's the satellite imagery. So this is publicly available um, for purchase. So it's a, at about a resolution of 50 centimeters. So that's what a tree looks like at, at 50 centimeters. This is what trees look like at about two centimeter resolution. So we'll look at trying to extract some fuel characteristics from these different types of images. So first having a look at the UAV imagery, these are the six locations. Essentially the, the first thing that we wanna to try to do is to put a box around a tree. This is ident tree identification. And it's the same algorithm that is used by your phone that puts a box around your face when you, when you try to unlock your phone, exact same algorithms. So we're pretty good at that, you know, somewhere between 70 to 80% accuracy. So recall and precision is how machine learning algorithms are, are assessed on their accuracy compared to the ground truth. So 70, 80% is not bad. That would improve if we had more imagery. So we only have these six locations which has about 5,000 trees being used to train the algorithms. So as we have more data in the training, we would have a, a corresponding higher degree of accuracy. So that's for putting a box around an individual tree. We're not usually interested in exactly where every single tree is. One of the characteristics that we might be interested in would be tree density. So looking at a stand and then using the individual trees to calculate density, we're actually much more accurate in doing that because a lot of those errors cancel out. So you might have had two boxes around a tree, or you might have some locations where you didn't catch a tree. So those errors that affect the recall and precision of individual tree identification are sort of averaged out a little bit when we go to a larger scale and look at just the density in a larger area. So that accuracy, we're at about uh, an R squared of 0.9. So about 90% accuracy when we're thinking about calculating the density of trees in an area. Once we've identified uh, the tree, so put a box around the tree, we can try to classify it. So, you know, which, once we put a box around a tree, what type of tree is that? Is that a coniferous tree or is that a deciduous tree? And that is very similar to your phone, you know, put a box around your face and then, you know, is it my face or your face? And if it's my face, it'll unlock my phone. Same idea here. We're trying, not trying to classify different people. We're trying to classify the trees as coniferous or deciduous. The next thing that we can do is look at structure from motion in order to get elevation data. So not only can we calculate density, we can calculate tree height for every tree that we've boxed or identified. Some of the applications, we've already discussed them. Um, as far as fuel characteristics that we can calculate, we can calculate densities to a fairly high accuracy, about 90%. We can calculate tree heights reasonably well. As long as the crowns don't overlap, we can get a fairly good estimate of, of the tree height if we can see the ground within that box. We can get a fairly good estimate of the width of the tree, so that the size of the crown, which would essentially be the size of the box that we place around a tree. And we can also calculate mixed wood proportions. So proportion of coniferous versus proportion of deciduous. Or we could calculate not just density of trees, we could calculate density of coniferous trees. Another thing that we could do is use these techniques for monitoring. So here's the Pelican Mountain, one of the Pelican Mountain sites. And we have a location that we have not uh, thinned. We have some locations where we have thinned and you can imagine I'm flying this with UAVs, identifying trees in these areas, calculating density, monitoring that over time, seeing how effective different treatments are, and using that in order to assess uh, uh, treatments of tree stands. Because we also have elevation, um, we get a, a fairly good 3D view of the stand. So how would we apply this? You could imagine um, flying over a community so my fire chief at Parkland County allowed me to uh, 
perform one of these surveys on his house. And maybe it's a little bit more clear if I remove the imagery and only show where the trees are. So this is showing the trees within 10 meters, within 30 meters, and potentially identifying them as, as different levels of, of hazard. The larger application of this would be to fly an entire community or the perimeter of a community, uh, calculate density of trees around a community because we're better at calculating density rather than identifying every single tree. So on a community scale, we're not necessarily interested in individual trees. We're interested in the distribution of trees around the community. And so this would be a, a very good application of this imagery. So that was mostly focusing on the UAV imagery, but what about the satellite imagery? So this is essentially the same type of data as the UAV data, but at a much coarser resolution. So at that 50 centimeter resolution, same algorithms, except in this case, we're not going to be classifying the tree. We're just looking to identify the location of the trees. Now applying this uh, for, to satellite data that occurs in the winter would allow us to understand the difference between coniferous and deciduous trees. So here we identified trees using the algorithms, uh, the machine learning algorithms, the same ones applied to the UAV imagery. And you can see that we do a pretty good job of overall um, identifying the density. So here's uh, the, the density calculated with, with manual annotations. This is sort of our ground truth and the machine learning algorithm does a pretty good job of reproducing that density. We don't have any vertical information. We can't understand um, tree height. Uh, there's not enough resolution on the elevation to uh, distinguish between ground and the tops of the trees. But we do have some, some promising uh, results for understanding coniferous versus deciduous when this is applied to imagery taken in the winter. We can extend that to maybe a community rather than looking at um, a river. Uh, so here's Bragg Creek for interest sake. I think it's pretty much what we would all expect. Um, everywhere is either high or um, based on this arbitrary definition of medium density. It's either high or medium density. So just to summarize, um, we're reasonably good at identifying trees, putting a box around trees in UAV imagery. We're really good at, once we have a box in UAV imagery, identifying it as conif coniferous or deciduous. We're quite good at uh, calculating density of trees using UAV imagery. So that's that 0.9 correlation. Using satellite imagery, we're reasonably good at calculating density. We're, we get fairly reasonable height information and size information from trees when we can see the ground around a tree. So when the crowns don't overlap to the point where you cannot see the ground. And we can calculate um, distances from different values at risk. Thank you very much for your time. Again, I'm Jeff Bovair, and feel free to email me at any time with any questions about any of this work. Hello, my name is Chris Hopkinson, and I'm a professor of geography and environment at the University of Lethbridge. I'm also director of the Artemis Lab, where we own and operate a range of LIDAR sensors for monitoring ecosystem properties and change. Of note, we fly missions across Canada using a Teledyne Optic multispectral LIDAR system that allows us to map terrain and vegetation cover in three-dimensional high resolution using three laser wavelengths. Over the next few minutes, I'll briefly introduce LIDAR and how we use it to map landscape scale biomass attributes. Well, first, LIDAR is the acronym Light Detection and Ranging, whereby laser pulses are emitted towards a target. Then, using our knowledge of the speed of light, the round-trip travel time of the pulse and its reflection is recorded to calculate distance. A scanner is employed to redirect those pulses across the target's surface to generate a three-dimensional point cloud. Most commercial airborne LiDAR mapping systems operate just outside the visible range in the near-infrared to shortwave infrared, and in addition to a 3D map of the Earth's surface, we also generate a laser-based intensity image. The light energy returned to the sensor will be a function of the surface geometry, contact area, and its reflectance. Over structured targets like buildings or trees, the emitted laser pulse will produce an elongated waveform corresponding to the time over which the pulse interacts with those surfaces. In most commercial sensors, this response is broken down into discrete returns to produce a point cloud. In the case of vegetation, the foliage density, structure, and height strongly influence the point cloud geometry. Raw point clouds can be visualized in three dimensions and colorized by a range of attributes like elevation, intensity, or return number. 
However, the primary derivative for most LiDAR acquisitions is the terrain or digital elevation model. In forestry and most ecosystem research, of course, vegetation structure is equally important, and this is where LiDAR excels by providing detailed canopy models. And with the latest multispectral LiDAR systems, we can produce composite images based on the three channel laser intensity. Using one of our recent multispectral LiDAR data collections over the Old Man River floodplain here in southern Alberta, we can visualize some of these point cloud attributes at the landscape scale. At left, we see the laser return number. In the center, we have true RGB colorization. And at right, we have elevation and intensity. In combination, such LiDAR datasets provide a rich, three-dimensional and thematic data environment for feature classification and modeling. Focusing on laser pulse intensity, here we see the grayscale response over the same wooded and bare ground landscape for all three laser channels of the Titan multispectral scanner. For applications that require vegetation structure, like biomass, carbon, habitat, merchantable volume, or wildfire fuel, a common approach is to extract statistical descriptors of the point cloud, such as height percentiles. Here, for example, we see how the 75th percentile, or P75, can be extracted from a hypothetical LiDAR sampling plot. Using field plot data, we can develop regression models against these point cloud metrics to predict a number of forest attributes, such as biomass as you can see from an area of the Taiga Plains in the Northwest Territories. And if we have LiDAR time series data captured over naturally growing forest stands, then we can develop biomass growth curves, as we see here for the berm sites in Saskatchewan. Combining percentile metrics with three-channel laser intensity creates new data structures for vegetation attribute mapping and modeling. For example, at top left, we see height profiles for different canopy types in the near-infrared channel, and in the two lower graphs, we see the deviations within each of the green and shortwave infrared channels. One way to capitalize on this rich information content is to generate vertical profiles of the normalized intensity ratios. Plotting these as voxels illustrates both vertical canopy structure and changing foliage reflectance properties throughout the canopy. As examples, here we see a study by Brinduza et al. that used the combined point cloud structure and intensity data to map species at the individual crown level. While here we see a data fusion model from the McDermott lab that adds in additional data metrics to model ground level coarse woody debris. To conclude my introduction to airborne LiDAR forest attribute mapping, I would like to summarize some of my lab's work over our Vivian Forest study site within the York Regional Forest in Ontario. We started collecting LiDAR here in 2000 using an Optech ALTM 1210 sensor and now have an archive spanning 20 years and every generation of LiDAR sensors since. Here we see the canopy height model time series that illustrates the influence of growth, stand treatment such as thinning, seasonal phenology, and differences in LiDAR hardware. Some of these influences are more easy to pick out, however, if we examine the changes in the point cloud cross-section over a mature conifer plantation. We do see the growth of the canopy, but we also see the gradual densification of the point cloud as instruments become faster and more capable. If we focus attention on the small, rapidly growing stand at left, we see how the point cloud captures the change in canopy height through time. However, it is obvious from this progression that by focusing on the upper canopy surface, a lot of the internal forest structure is missed, hence illustrating the value of extracting as much information from the point cloud as is possible. Finally, even without point cloud structure information, we are able to visualize differences in land cover and forest type using multispectral LiDAR intensity alone. The image at right is a false color composite of the three channel intensity bands, and at left we see intensity signatures for dominant land covers within the study area. Applying these signatures to a simple maximum likelihood classifier allows us to map out these land covers and separate the dominant forest types. So this concludes my very brief introduction to airborne LiDAR for vegetation forest attribute extraction, and I do hope it has been informative. If you wish to dig deeper into the concepts or case studies touched upon here, here is a list of the sources or related studies. And finally, I'd like to thank you for watching. And as well, I must thank the various funding agencies and partners that have supported our research over the years. In particular, a special debt of gratitude goes out to all the students and fellows who have kept us at the cutting edge, as well as my two most supportive LiDAR research partners, Dr. Laura Chasma and Teledyne Optic. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to another Fuels Friday video. My name is Hilary Cameron and I am a research assistant at the University of Alberta. 
In this video, we will talk about how LiDAR, a form of remote sensing, can be used to measure fuels. As an example, I am going to present some of the research I completed for my Master of Science thesis at the University of Alberta. My research focused on using airborne LiDAR to predict fuel characteristics important to wildland fire behavior in black spruce stands. The funding for this research was provided by the Alberta Agriculture and Forestry through the Canadian Partnership of Wildland Fire Science. We are all here today because we understand the importance of being able to characterize fuels for things like wildfire behavior modeling or community protection planning. Often, fuel structure information is collected by hand, which is extremely time consuming and expensive. In this video, I'm going to show you how LiDAR can be used to map fuels at much finer detail and across much broader areas compared to field measurements. So first off, what is LiDAR? LiDAR is a form of remote sensing that uses lasers to get X, Y, and Z coordinates of objects. When we mount a LiDAR system on an aircraft, it emits laser pulses that shoot towards the ground. When the laser hits something, be it a branch, a shrub, or the ground itself, some of the energy is reflected back to the sensor. Because we know exactly where the aircraft is in space and how fast the laser travels, we can get very accurate locations of whatever object the laser intercepted. With this information, we can generate point clouds which can paint a picture of what a forest looks like without ever having to actually step foot on the ground. This is an example of what a point cloud can look like. Each little dot represents a location where a laser reflected off of an object and returned back to the sensor on the aircraft. The dark blue dots in this image represent ground hits, and the yellow dots represent laser hits that occurred near the top of the canopy. LiDAR metrics describe the attributes and distribution of the point clouds and can be compared to field measurements to make a model. On the right side of this slide, I have cut a LiDAR point cloud to the boundaries of two different field sampling plots. We are looking at the forest in a profile view. So again, the dark blue dots represent laser pulses that hit the ground and the yellow dots represent returns from the top of the canopy. We can see from these two images that the point clouds look very different, and that's because the forest structure is very different. The top image represents a stand that is very dense, so a lot of those laser pulses are getting stuck in the canopy. The bottom image represents a stand that is quite open, so most of the laser pulses are able to reach the forest floor. Lighter metrics such as the mean return height or the percentage of returns above a certain height threshold would be very different between these two plots. In order to use LiDAR to map fuels, we need to create a model. You can develop a model by comparing field measured variables that you are interested in to LiDAR metrics calculated for the same field plots. Forest parameters that might be of interest to us could be canopy height, canopy fuel load, canopy bulk density, stem density, or canopy base height. Common LiDAR metrics used for modeling are the percentage of returns above 1.37 meters, mean return height, or the 99th percentile return height, as some examples. Once you are confident in your model, you can apply it to similar forest types and map forest fuel data with much more detail and on a much broader scale than possible with field data alone. For example, I've created a model to predict canopy bulk density in black spruce stands located in Alberta. These are the results when I applied the model to unseen testing data. The x-axis represents field measured canopy bulk density values and the y-axis represents LiDAR predicted canopy bulk density values. I've used a square root transformation to satisfy the basic requirements for linear regression. The diagonal line on this graph represents a one-to-one -one relationship. So if the model was absolutely perfect, all those dots would be directly on that diagonal line. The small amounts of scatter you see are the error of the model. Once we are confident in our models, we can apply them across large spatial areas. Here I have a map showing the variability of canopy bulk density over a research site. 
The areas in light red represent regions where the model is predicting a low canopy bulk density, and the areas in dark red represent areas where the model is predicting a high canopy bulk density. Models are stance type specific, and the one I made was for black spruce stands. I've grayed out water bodies, mulched areas, or stands that are not black spruce in this figure. The black dots on this image represent areas where we have field data. You can see that where the model predicts a low canopy fuel load, it aligns with forest stands that are very open. The intermediate red color aligns with stands that are relatively dense, but you can still walk around and see what's going on. The dark red color aligns with some overwhelmingly dense black spruce stands. These represent areas where it would be difficult for firefighters to move around, and you could expect very high intensity crown fires under the right conditions. For reference, I'm showing the fire behavior prediction fuel type map for the same research site. Almost the whole research site is classified as C2, which is the boreal spruce fuel type and is shown in dark green on this map. If you were to use this fuel map to model wildfire behavior, you would assume that anything in dark green would burn the same way. But we can tell from looking at the photos that this wouldn't be true. In this case, LIDAR allows us to evaluate the forest in much more detail and can get us more accurate fire behavior predictions. Models can be created for other stand attributes as well. Here I have mapped canopy fuel load on the left hand side and canopy height on the right hand side. Once again, the darker shades represent areas of higher value and the grayed areas represent water bodies, mulched areas, or forest types different than what the model was created for. If you are interested in this work or developing your own models, I've attached some resources that can help you get started. I've also attached the sources to the pictures in this video that are not mine. I'm always eager to talk about LiDAR and fuel measurements, so if you'd like to reach out to me personally, feel free to do so. Thank you to the Alberta Agriculture and Forestry for funding this research through the Canadian Partnership of Wildland Fire Science, as well as all the other organizations that made the research presented in this video possible. Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Chasmer. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environment at the University of Lethbridge. My research uses remote sensing, field measurements, and hydrometeorological instrumentation to understand vegetation changes over time and through space. I have operated and worked with airborne and terrestrial LIDAR systems for almost 20 years, and during that time I have seen some impressive developments while working with my partners in the Artemis lab, Dr. Chris Hopkinson and Maxim Akramenko. Today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of some airborne LiDAR metrics that are useful for quantifying canopy and understory fuel properties in forests. These can be determined from point clouds in this mature forest or from interpolated attributes of the canopy envelope, point density, and understory seen here. Laser pulses reflect from the canopy understory structures before reflecting from the ground surface. LiDARs can measure ground surface elevation, which can also be interpolated into gridded project products. Unlike optical remote sensing, the laser is able to penetrate through the canopy and therefore the understory and ground surface characteristics are not occluded by overlying vegetation, as we can see from this boreal forest and peatland site. The density of laser returns at this site we surveyed south of Fort McMurray last summer provides very high spatial resolution 3D measurements throughout the canopy, including shrubs, black spruce trees, and variations in ground surface terrain. Let's first take a look at some of the terrain-based attributes that can be determined from elevation data. Here we see a 1 meter pixel resolution hillshade model derived from the elevation data from the same site south of Fort McMurray. This is a 2 km by 2 km subset of a much larger area surveyed using the University of Lethbridge Titan multispectral LiDAR. Topographic position, which indicates low-lying and upraised areas of the DEM, can indicate areas closer to the water table. The Titan LiDAR system also provides laser reception with three wavelengths, illustrated here where areas that are red to pink indicate areas of high shortwave infrared reflection associated with recent fire. Green indicate areas of high reflection in the green wavelength, and blue to green indicate reflection in both the green and near infrared associated with 
healthy vegetation. Absorption and reflection of shortwave infrared laser wavelengths is also associated with moisture characteristics of the ground surface. Notice the topographically low-lying areas are also associated with higher shortwave infrared absorption and moisture content at the time of the survey. Vegetation height can indicate areas of high fuels and can, when combined with the solar input model can provide spatiotemporal estimates of areas of radiation loading and drying. Let's look more closely at forest structural attributes that are useful for quantifying canopy bulk density loading and some understory fuels by looking at a mature conifer stand A, at a mature hardwood stand B in Ontario. The LiDAR point cloud we can see here provides a lot of information on the canopy and understory structures. We could measure tree height, crown depth, understory and ladder fuels, crown separation, the height of the base of the crown. We can also differentiate stem density in some of the conifer stands. Just a couple hundred meters away, we can see the rounded shape of these maple trees. We can also measure tree height, the depth of the crown, the crown width. We notice that there's little understory in this stand. For some trees, we can approximate the base of the crown. In this forest, crowns are overlapping. Therefore, it is difficult to differentiate between individual trees. From these point clouds, we can derive other canopy attributes. We can also vertically slice through the interpolated point density, densities illustrated here as we move from understory in reds and oranges up through to the top of the canopy in cooler greens to blue at one meter increments. The ratio of intercepted pulses to those that make it to the ground surface provides a simple estimate of canopy fractional cover, which compared well over, at over 100 hemispherical photoplots coincident with airborne LiDAR data collected at sites across Canada in the early to mid 2000s. Volumetric LiDAR data derivatives also compare well with allometrically derived and harvested dry biomass from trees while PhD student Linda Flade has worked on expansion factors for shrubs and short tree biomass, which are compared with time series LiDAR data collected in rapidly changing boreal permafrost environments in the Northwest Territories. To understand available fuels from LiDAR-derived biomass found within the canopy and understory, classification of vegetation species is also required. Here, Humera is using the Titan multispectral LiDAR to identify differences in structures and scattering characteristics in the near-infrared and shortwave infrared laser returns from deciduous shrubs and short to medium height conifer tree species, which contribute to ladder fuels. In addition to living fuels, the rate of laser pulse emission of airborne LiDAR systems is continuously advancing. While tree stems and branching structures of living trees may be only occasionally be observed, at the base of standing tree canopies, airborne lidars are able to measure fallen and leaning dead tree stems observed here a decade after fire. We can draw a narrow profile and extract the point cloud illustrating fallen and leaning trees. If we zoom in, we can see these fallen trees more closely as they are elevated above the ground surface and can be easily identified using artificial intelligence algorithms. If more detail is required, terrestrial laser scanning is a good alternative for quantifying understory ladder fuels. Here, Zhao Zhen developed deep learning methods to identify stem and branching structures. Based on the characteristics of these structures, he was able to accurately determine tree species and biomass for individual trees and at the plot level. By combining the variety of data derivative products from LiDAR, we will be able to quantify the spatial variability of available canopy and understory fuels and vegetation species within the landscape, topographic position, and the potential for moist to dry soils, and also areas of high radiation loading, which may increase drying at a snapshot in time. The goal is to use this information to evaluate how these impact weekly measurements from passive optical sensors. We can also use pre- and post-fire LiDAR data to understand vegetation structures and topographical conditions 
influencing burn severity, as Shinieri has illustrated using this false color composite of LiDAR return intensities of the Horse River wildfire. Areas with the most severe burn are illustrated in dark red, which indicates high reflectance of the shortwave infrared. In the subset pr area prior to the fire, we can see areas of high canopy volume in green, while shrub a shrubby fen between two arrows contains little tree and shrub biomass. After the fire, we see variable losses of biomass associated with topographically low-lying moist areas. In conclusion, LiDAR is a useful technology for measuring many important structural attributes of tree and understory canopies. While it does not measure all fire fuels, it is not greatly impacted by occlusion as optical imagery is. LiDAR data collections are costly, but can reduce reliance on extensive and expensive field programs, though field da validation data should always be collected coincident with LiDAR data collections. LiDAR data and da derivative products may improve our understanding of fire behavior if used as inputs into models. Finally, time series LiDAR data collections can be used to quantify changing vegetation structures and conditions over time and through space. I'd like to say a big thank you to our Remote Sensing and Northern Ecology Group and to Canada Wildfire for their support. Thank you, Laura. And um, I think we have a little bit of time for uh, a question or two for, for Laura in the chat, um, if you've got questions. Um, and, and while I give you a chance to post questions there to the chat, I just want to thank all of our presenters uh, today for the excellent uh, presentations. And um, I want to um, encourage you all to, to think about what you saw today and potentially, if you have time, rewatch some of these videos. Um, I'm going to be posting them on the workshop site uh, in, in leading into to sessions three and four, where we're going to have a lot of time for discussion. And, and actually, if there's, if there's questions for any of our speakers uh, who, who you've heard from this morning, uh, you can post those there. And then the other place you can post them is, is on the forum. Everybody's a little overwhelmed by the content. Well, thanks very much for participating today. Um, as it's really wonderful to see such a, a great turnout. And we're really looking forward to seeing you in weeks three and four uh, for some ongoing discussion. And uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jen. I think you look great. Is Laura here? <laughs> We'll talk to you at about one. Thanks all, that was fantastic. Thanks everyone. Um, I will send you some in some evaluation links via eClass um, and we'll see you at the next Fuels Friday next Friday at 9am so that's session three, which is the advantages and challenges. And we will be um, having a breakout session so we'll have smaller groups for that session and give you time to discuss the topic questions. So thanks everyone and we'll see you next week. <laughs>